God has prepared a place for those who trust Him and obey. Jesus will come again, and though we don't know when, the countdown's getting lower every day. Ten and nine, eight and seven, six and five and four. Call upon the Savior while you may. Three and two, coming through the clouds in bright array. Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, hope you were uh, ready to, to join in and jump up and down with uh, Esri and, and her mom helping her with uh, a little Palm Sunday song. Uh, one that I hadn't heard, but uh, definitely uh, it's looked like a lot of fun. And uh, so we'll sing the adult version of, of one of our Hosanna songs, because I think that's a good place to start. But just before we begin our service, uh, let us have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your blessings. We thank you for all that you do for us. We thank you for special times of the year when we can celebrate uh, unique and special events that uh, led the way to us knowing you and, and, and knowing how to love you and serve you and receive your love. We ask that you would bless this service in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know what it was like on the day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem, but everything I read about it, uh, the crowd got pretty excited. I don't even know if they all knew what they were excited about. As crowds usually do, it just gets contagious. So maybe this will get a little contagious this morning if you can let yourselves just kind of put your mind in that place. Jesus is, is entering the city and they're thinking, this is it. Messiah has come. And uh, for them, this was their rapture day. And they were pretty excited. So um, let's, uh, let's begin with Hosanna. Hosanna, you are the God who saves us. You are worthy of all our praises. Praise is rising, eyes are turning to you. We turn to you. Hope is stirring, hearts are yearning for you. We long for you. Because when we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. They're washed away. Hosanna, Hosanna. You are the God who saves us. You're worthy of all our praise. 
Jesus. Hosanna, Hosanna. Come have your way among us. We welcome you here, Lord Jesus. Hear the sound of hearts returning to you. We turn to you. In your kingdom, broken lives are made new. You make all things new. So when we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. They're washed away. Hosanna, Hosanna. You are the God who saves us. You're worthy of all our praises. Hosanna, Hosanna. Come have your way among us. We welcome you here, Lord Jesus. Hosanna, 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 Hosanna. You are the God who saves us, You're worthy of all our praises. Hosanna, Hosanna, come have your way among us. We welcome you here, Lord Jesus. Hosanna, Hosanna. Come, the God who saves us. You're worthy of all our praises. Hosanna, Hosanna. Come, have your way among us. We're worthy of all. Come, your way among us. We welcome you here, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. That's great. And you know, on that day, something very uh, significant was happening. The people spontaneously began to praise because while God does so much for us, and it seems like we can do so little for him in return. One of the things that we can always do and is always received by God is praise. And um, so for all of our, our doing and all of our, our wanting to do something back for God, one of the things that he has given us to do and is always appropriate is to just speak out or sing out praise. It doesn't matter if you got a good voice or a bad voice. It doesn't matter whether you sing loud or you kind of sing under your breath because you think, well, don't want anybody really to hear me or spoil the song. It's what's going on in here. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Great life 
you give life you are love you bring life to the darkness you give hope you restore every heart that is broken great are you lord it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise pour out our praise it's your So we pour out our praise to you only. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise, pour out our praise. It's your breath. In our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. you today and we thank you that no matter where we are, no matter what we do, we can look to you in every situation and know that you are with us. You never leave us. And we can lift up a, a song of praise, whether it's out loud or under our breath or even in the quiet of our minds and know that you hear us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. great to see there are people in the building as well as people joining us on the live stream. Of course, I can't see you on the live stream, but Jer's at the control panel there, and he would see that there are people there. There are people there, right? 
Okay, good. <laughs> I'm not just talking to this camera that is doing nothing. But um, it is just wonderful to be here and know that no matter what we do, God always loves us. Now, he doesn't love everything we do, but he always loves us. And I think our kids kind of knew that. They knew we loved them, but they knew also on days when we didn't love what they did uh, that they got a little different uh, talking to. But it never interfered with the fact that they were loved. Uh, you know, it's part of our human nature, also part of our Western culture as it has developed, uh, to want to see, to experience, and to hear new and interesting things. I don't know about you, if, if, you know, if there's people here that say, I never want to hear anything new, I just uh, I want to be very ordinary and boring. Uh, Pam has certainly had her fill of boring, repetitive tasks uh, since being injured uh, in the car accident and having to do these little stretches with her hand and, you know, and uh, trying to close it and open it and, and over and over and over again. Uh, she's worked her way all the way up to now she can squeeze putty ten different ways. And she does this all day, every day, um, or so it must seem to her. Uh, I used to enjoy checking the news headlines to see what was new in the world, but I have noticed, as many others have, that's pretty much every story in the past year has been about COVID-19, or some variant of that story. Um, and I, I just don't even enjoy checking the news anymore. And uh, Pam does not enjoy my jokes. Um, but nevertheless, as much as we want to hear new and interesting things, and we want life to be about positive change, of course, we don't like negative change, but nevertheless, some stories get repeated and no one seems to mind much, depending on the context. Like our family, in our family we had this habit of telling stories when we would get together and stories that we'd all heard before and they typically started with do you remember the time and then just fill in the blank and you you knew you were going to hear a story that you already knew but you would all enjoy it again together um, there may be the odd person like Pam when she came into our family she didn't know all the stories so she had to hear them all for the first time and everybody's laughing about these stories and they don't fill the, in all the gaps in the stories so you know it's kind of like yeah 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 and they, they go on it's kind of like when, when girls are talking and I can't follow the conversation at all because they get about three words and then it's yeah 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 and the other one has already filled the rest of the sentence so neither of them have to actually complete a sentence but I'm there saying what? are you talking about? And, um, you know, so we would tell these stories. And uh, when I was young, uh, I, was, I was young once, um, every year about this time of the year, they would put on an old movie. It was a 1939 movie, um, which was before my time. Some of my much older sisters, well, no, it's even before their time. Um, but uh, this old 1939 movie, they put it on what, we call television. Now, television was what we used after radio, but before computers um, and computer monitors. Um, they still call them televisions, uh, roughly speaking, but um, people don't, it's not publicly broadcast TV the way we did it even when I was younger. So even though I had seen this movie many times, I would still get all excited because they were showing The Wizard of Oz. And I, we would sit down and spend the evening watching The Wizard of Oz. Can't say I've watched it much since then. Um, but the Bible is filled with stories that are told and retold. For instance, every December, as we approach the 25th of December, at least in this part of the world, we read or have read to us the story of Jesus' birth. And it's just kind of expected. It just doesn't seem to be Christmas if we don't have that story in some fashion uh, displayed at least as Christians. Now, there are others that, that uh, have done away with that. But similarly, as we approach this season, which we call Easter, um, we read the stories that lead up to Jesus' uh, death and then his resurrection. And so there's a whole section there, the, the last little part of Jesus' life, um, 
that we, we go over those stories. And we are a week away from what would be Resurrection Sunday. And uh, we call this Sunday Palm Sunday. So I will endeavor to read through a very familiar story of Jesus making his great entry into Jerusalem, riding on a donkey with the crowds cheering and shouting, Hosanna. Hopefully uh, I can point out a few lessons um, by way of just uh, things that you may, um, they may come as a reminder or they actually may just be something you hadn't thought of or, or maybe not thought of for some time. The thing with Bible stories that makes them different from, say, my family stories is that we can apply them to our own life situations and learn from them. Not that I can't learn something from my family stories, because I did some really stupid things, and I learned to be less stupid in a couple of ways. I always find new things to be stupid about. But, um, you know, we can apply them. It's not that you don't at all, but they're not just funny stories because they make you laugh. They are stories that have a point. And the stories that were included in uh, all the way from Genesis on through to the New Testament were put there not just for our understanding or for our interest, but also for our learning. And so we'll be reading from Matthew's account, Matthew's gospel account of the entry into Jerusalem a week before uh, what was their Jewish Passover, which was also the uh, time in which Jesus was arrested, later crucified, and then um, three days later rose from the dead. That would be something we'll talk about next week a little bit. But um, Matthew chapter 21, and I'll be looking at verses 1 to 17, or parts thereof. So Matthew 21, uh, verse 1 to 3. As they approached Jerusalem, this is Jesus and his disciples, as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says to you, oh, if anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. So Jesus is about to fulfill some important prophetic events over the next few days. And it has been argued that while Jesus simply orchestrated these events to make it look like he was fulfilling prophecy, to make it look like he was Messiah, and and that might have been possible for a a few parts of this story, not this particular story, but the whole unfolding of the, the last days of Jesus, It might be possible for a few parts, such as choosing to enter Jerusalem on a donkey. I mean, he could have orchestrated that piece, um, and and in a sense he did. He told them to go get the donkey. But much of what happens around him and to him are not things he could have orchestrated or in any way controlled, including the reaction of the crowd that day. I mean, you can ride into town on a donkey. Lots of people do it all the time. Um, they always depict uh, Jesus' mother coming on a donkey, you know, when she's pregnant with Jesus. I don't know that she did or didn't, but they always put her on a donkey, and uh, they, they, they don't get the same response as what Jesus got here. When Matthew wrote about it, he points out that Jesus' ride into Jerusalem was predicted hundreds of years before, um, and he quotes Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. Zechariah 9 and 9 Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly, and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Something I want to point out in this part of the story involves the unnamed person who just happened to have a donkey and a colt in the right place at the right time. We don't really think about that. We don't know who, who, who had this donkey. We, we, we don't know, you know how Jesus even knew it was there and knew that they would be willing to uh, lend this donkey. But it says in verse 3, they were to tell the person, whoever this person might be, when they say, hey, why are you taking my donkey? I mean, you don't just go and grab somebody's donkey. Um, it's like jumping in someone's car and driving off with it. 
They were told to tell the person the Lord needs them. The donkey and the foal. God spoke the world into existence. He made all of the animals with a word. And he made us from the dust of the ground. I mean, think about it. What does God really need? That he can't make himself. But Jesus, being God in human form, needed someone's donkey and colt. God chooses. This is what I take from this. You, you take what you, you feel is appropriate. God chooses to use us for tasks and for, for the supply of certain needs because he wants us to be part of his great work, part of his kingdom. He doesn't have to use us. He chooses to use us. Um, so don't take for granted anything that you might do for God, large or small, because it is a privilege to serve in any way that we are called to serve. Um, I work with people in my role at hospice, and the, the primary focus of, of somebody in a palliative team is, is obviously somebody with a serious illness. And they come to us... Um, having this serious diagnosis, and, and even if the trajectory of their health hasn't got to that place, it will get to that place unless uh, they recover, which can happen but often doesn't, um, where they need help. The point is we, we, we work with a lot of people that, that need extra help. And one thing that I have noticed is that many have a hard time receiving help from others because they've always been the ones that supplied help. They've always been the helpers, and they don't like being the helpies or the helpless. Retired nurses are known to have this difficulty. I've certainly run into that. They're, they're, they're a group that are difficult to help at times, as do many men who think they can do it themselves. And when they can't do it themselves, they have a difficult time accepting and receiving help. Um, Lots of reasons for that, but the basis is it's just part of our human nature. We, if, we can, if we are capable to do things ourselves, we don't want others helping us. And I've had to navigate that even as my uh, body becomes a little older. I can't lift that piano quite as easy as I used to, and so I sometimes have to ask my boys to lift the piano. And I can lift it, but I'm going to be hurting for a lot of days, and eventually I won't be able to lift it at all. And so wisdom says, get a little help when you need it. But it's, it's not easy. But ultimately, if you think about it, God, if anybody doesn't need our help, God doesn't need our help. And he's not getting old. Well, he's old, but he's not getting old in the way we get old. He's not weak. He is not out of resources. He doesn't need our help, but he chooses to ask for it and receive it anyway. And that's something to, to really keep in mind. When you do stuff for God, it's because he is wanting you to be part of what he's doing. It's not that he can't do it without you. And if you choose to, to refuse to do something for God, he'll get somebody else. I remember Reinhard Bonnke, uh, a preacher that um, did some meetings in this, this part of the world, but he, he also did things over in Africa and other places. And I remember him telling this story about how that God called him to do this ministry of, of, of um, basically going to large crowds and... and um, it, compelling them to, to receive uh, salvation in Christ and, and to receive things from God. And when he was called, um, he struggled with that call, and God said, well, you're not the first one I called, and you're not even the second one I called. There's a couple that have turned it down. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I don't know, you know, the, the truth of that story, that's his story, I, I, I'm not questioning him, but... I do have that understanding that, that God calls us, but he doesn't make us do it. He just asks us, would you like to help? And if we're willing to help, then, uh, then we get to be part of it. So somebody got to help Jesus that day. And all they had to do was lend a donkey and a, and a colt. The other thing that you may pay attention to is God's attitude as expressed through Jesus in this story. He comes in not as some mighty warrior 
trying to tell the people, okay, this is the way it's going to be, and you better just bow. He could have, I guess, but he didn't. He didn't come as a mighty warrior on a white steed, but it says in chapter 21, verse 5, he came gentle and riding on a donkey. Think about his attitude, his, his way of approach. Um, there will be a day when Jesus comes on the white horse. We read about it in the Revelation. Um, but this approach at this time is gentle and humble. As you would come to a young child, God calls softly and gently to each of us many times in our lives and at various points, even when we are far from him or not really listening. And if we're not listening, then maybe we don't hear, and then maybe there's a time down the road when we'll hear again. It pays to pay attention to that. I would rather talk to God when he's coming to me as a friend, gently and quietly, than talk to him on the day of judgment when I have told him, you go jump in the lake, I can do this by myself, and then all of a sudden he says, well, how's that working for you? Uh, it's time to make account for your life. And the one thing that was most important was that you received my forgiveness and, and healing of your, your spiritual darkness, and you didn't get around to that. If we, as humans, could only pick up on that attitude, because it is humans that get all loud and harsh and judgmental when we're addressing others, that we determine for ourselves are not as spiritual as we are. And maybe if you've been around church circles long enough, you've seen some of that. But we could learn from, from Jesus how to approach hurting and lost souls, gentle and with humility, knowing that and remembering that it was once us in need of an encounter with a loving God. Now, you may have grown up in that. It might have happened in your childhood in the f context of your family, or it might have been like myself who had happened as an adult. But there was a day when I realized I needed something, and, and God somehow got the message through that, why don't you try this? And I did, and I haven't looked back. But if somebody had been all up in my face, I don't think I would have received that message nearly as well. Um, so as we know from the story... The crowds get excited. They put their cloaks on the road. They take off their coats and they put them on the road for him to, to ride the donkey over. They cut down palm branches and spread them on the road. So they're making this sort of red carpet, if you will. They're making this, this, uh, this place for, for Jesus to, and his donkeys to, to make this, uh, this uh, special ride into Jerusalem because they're expecting something great. They don't even know exactly what to expect, but they know it's going to be great. At least they think they know. And they shouted praises to God all the while. Matthew chapter 21, verse 8. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And they, um, of course, taking this from, from some Old Testament scriptures, uh, as much of this is being played out as a prophetic, uh, uh, basically a, an answer to prophetic calls. But it said that the whole city was stirred. I can't imagine that. I can't imagine, uh, you know, taking a ride down Young Street and having the whole city of Toronto be stirred. Not a lot of people there in Jerusalem, not quite as many as in Toronto, but a lot of people. Um, hundreds of thousands. As, as I understand it, for this big festival that was coming. The whole city was stirred, but they were not all stirred in a positive way. So I want to look at what happens when Jesus actually gets into the city and gets to the temple. I mean, we've, we've had messages, I've, I've preached them. I said to Jer, I said, uh, for 35 years I've been preaching a Palm Sunday message or sat while somebody else preached, if I could palm it off on them. And, sorry, I can't help myself. Uh, but it was always, often at least, focused on the, the, the triumphal entry, the, the, the march into Jerusalem. What happens when he gets there? I mean, I don't know what they were expecting, but let's look at what actually happens. 
Matthew chapter 21, verses 12 and 13. First thing that we read after he gets into town, he gets to the temple. Jesus entered the temple, 21 and 12. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. So Jesus gets a little annoyed with what he sees when he gets there because the whole, it would be the court of the Gentiles is where this would happen. And it was filled like a marketplace with people buying and selling it because people would come there and they would want to give uh, sacrifices. That was part of Jewish worship was to sacrifice doves and, and, and lambs and all kinds of things. And they, rather than, because they would travel from a, a distant place, uh, many of them, there were locals, but there were others that traveled you know, from far away. Rather than have to drag a, these animals along with them, they would conveniently have them sold there. So convenience stores were, were actually a thing back then. And so you didn't have to take your sheep all the way or your goat or whatever you took all the way to Jerusalem, especially if you're going to sacrifice a bull. I don't know if anybody brought bulls, but that would be quite a thing. Um, but you didn't have to bring it 500 miles on foot. You, you actually could just go there and buy it, of course, at an inflated price, no doubt. And uh, they had to pay their, their, their taxes or their, their, their money to God in temple money. So they would use Roman coins and they would exchange them for, for temple currency. So it was a, a special currency that they had at an interest. And so all of this was going on. And Jesus looked at that picture and he said, guys, this is wrong. Get out of here. Now, I've heard people focus when, when talking about these verses. I've heard people focus on this as evidence that any kind of commerce that is connected with church is wrong and upsets God. And, um, you know, there was much more going on here, I think, than a few book tables at the back of the church or a bake sale. This isn't just about the fact that there was commerce going on. The Jewish money changers and the sellers of sacrificial animals were taking advantage of thousands of people here that had come to worship God. And they actually make their, made their businesses a barrier between the people and God. I liked what one person said about it. They said uh, they did it in the temple uh, or the part of the temple called the, the court of the Gentiles. Now, when the temple was constructed and designed, when God laid out the design and they built it, there was a place for the Jewish people to come and do their, their worship. The high priest would, would uh, take the sacrificial's uh, blood into the Holy of Holies at, at the appropriate times in their worship calendar and all of these things. There was a place for the Jews to come and worship, but there was a place before you got to that, called the court of the Gentiles, where people that were non-Jewish could come and approach God. Now, they couldn't go further into the temple, into the holy place, but they could come to the court of the Gentiles. And God's plan was always to make his love and his grace and his mercy available to all the nations, not just the Jewish nation. But they never really paid much attention to that. Uh, if you look at it down through their history, it was always kind of about them. And so, well, court of the Gentiles, who cares about them? We don't even like them. There was prejudice in those days. You know, maybe there was a, a bit of a Gentile lives matter thing going on. And they set up their market there. In the only place that was appointed for the Gentiles to approach God, they had made it a barrier to the Gentile nations. So I think Jesus was seeing a lot more than just some... some people selling doves and uh, exchanging money. He was seeing a lot more going on. So what are you saying then? Is it wrong to carry on business? I don't think it's wrong to carry on business. It is not wrong even to encourage people to give towards the work of God. But let's not make that the focus of our gathering. I have seen preachers take up to an hour and sometimes more to take an offering. I've also heard people complain that a sermon went beyond 10 minutes because uh, that was way too long. What, what's wrong with those two pictures? You try to put them together. Of course, not in the same place because the, the churches that have the 10-minute sermons are not the ones where they take the one-hour offerings. But we could get... 
our sense of priorities sorted out a bit better at times, I believe, as churches and as, as believers. Certain things are important to do. It's just when you come to worship and to learn about God, if there is somebody there that's going to, to teach or, or, or preach, uh, make that your thing you do. And so the times of the great feasts when they came to the temple to worship in, in according to, to Jewish Old Testament law, Jesus is looking at that, and he went there since childhood. He came to the temple. It was his, his habit was to be there. Um, and he looked at it and said, guys, you got your priorities wrong here. You're, you're messing this up. And so he got a little annoyed with the money changers and the, the sellers because they'd, they, they brought all these animals in, and they're just making a big mess here. You could do that outside the gate and do the same thing, and it would have been fine. But don't do it in the temple. What comes next is often not touched on on Palm Sunday messages, um, but it's the reaction of the Jewish leaders. Okay, so Jesus comes in. He gets all rowdy with the, the people um, and turns over a few tables. We have thoughts about that. Jesus is in the temple now. He's made his grand entrance. What does he do after he chases these money changers away? Verse 14, chapter, Matthew chapter 21, verse 14, said the blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. Jesus didn't come in just to, to um, tell everybody else what not to do, but he demonstrates what to do. But notice who does not pick up on this very well. The very next verse, 2115. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did, and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. They were ugly. They saw Jesus performing miracles, but it was like this didn't matter at all. It's like, well, we really don't care. I don't know how he's doing these little parlor tricks, making blind people see and, and lame people walk. I'm not just sure how he's doing that. Uh, and we're not going to get into that because these kids are praising him up. And this is what they got all, all indignant about. So instead, they focused on the children shouting praises. And not just that they were praising God, but they were praising God on account of this Jesus guy. They were jealous. And in their pride and in their jealousy, they became blind to what was really going on. So they say to Jesus, they, they're, they're, they're not going to keep quiet about this. Verse 16, do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. <laughs> it's like he's not going to hear it. Of course he's hearing it. They, the, the whole crowd shouted him into the city, and now the kids are still hanging around. They're, they're shouting Hosanna. They're pretty excited. Kids will go on longer than adults, I find, when excitement is in the air. Um, I get this much excited about Christmas, but a four-year-old gets this much excited about Christmas. They're still going on about it. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. They are rebuking Jesus for allowing children to praise God and praise God in the context of Jesus who is doing the work of God right in front of them, showing himself to be God manifest in the flesh by the miracles that he does or what they refer to as their Messiah. And they don't like it. But notice how Jesus replies to them. He could have just corrected them. In fact, he could have called fire down. I mean, he could have done a lot of things. He could have said, okay, crispy critter number one, you guys still ugly at me? Crispy critter number two, still mouthing off? Okay, let's just keep going down the line until all the leaders either change their attitude or they um, got the lightning bolt. He could have done a lot of things, but he didn't do those things. Notice how he replies. Yes, Jesus, replied Jesus. This is the rest of that verse, 21 verse 16. Have you never read from the lips of children and infants the Lord has called forth your praise? Have you never read? He starts. Now Jesus is quoting from a psalm that all Jews were expected to have memorized. It was one of their sort of standard 
and, and from very young age. They, they should have memorized this. They would have been taught it over and over. This is their memory verse. This is their Pledge of Allegiance. Not really the Pledge of Allegiance. They, they memorized a lot of scripture. That's just the way it was done in that day because it was more of an oral tradition than a written tradition still. And so they had to commit it to memory. Um, but they were expected to memorize this. He said, have you never read? As if to say, you know what this is. You know exactly what this is, or at least you should. You've learned this from childhood. You teach this to others. And it was from Psalm chapter 8, verse 2. I'll read that verse from the NIV, Psalm 8 and 2. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. Now, I looked up this verse because I've heard a couple of... it. it um, Quoted a couple of different ways over times. And um, there's two main renderings for this particular thing of, uh, you know, uh, through the, the, the praise of children or through the, the voice of children. Two, the two main renderings. One is from the, the Masoretic text. Now, if, I'm not going to stay on this, so don't, don't click out here. But there's one... Um, rendering or one set of uh, old... Uh, Testament scriptures that they use as, as authoritative, um, which is a, a Hebrew set that's called a Masoretic text. The Tanakh is the, what the, the books are called. But um, the two men renderings, that one is f f rendered founded strength, or the, I think it says established a stronghold. The Septuagint, which was a Greek translation, which actually is their, their copies are earlier than the other one, but um, not always... Uh, counted as, 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 as equal to. And I, I don't pretend to know all of this stuff. I just know that there's different, two different renderings. One is in Greek, one is in, in Hebrew. And in the Septuagint, this verse is rendered um, perfected praise. You have, perf out of the mouths of children, you have perfected praise. The other one says, you have founded strength. I think the, the NIV translators, maybe in their way, tried to capture both of these ideas because he said through the praise of children you have established a stronghold I like that idea you have perfected praise why why does God perfect praise from children why does he use children to speak to us it's another place where it says a little child will lead them why does God use children well one they don't have any biases at least not nearly the amount of biases that we as adults have so they don't come with a preconceived idea about things they're they're very innocent in that way i don't think little Ezra when she was jumping up and down and saying hosanna and jump 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 i don't think she was really thinking deeply and theologically and taking in all of the the little cultural nuances and and all of that stuff why did god perfect praise in children and why does jesus bring it up to silence God's enemies. I wonder if these Jewish leaders that were speaking to him that day even realized that Jesus is telling them that he sees them as the enemies of God. He's saying, these kids are, 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 are saying Hosanna, and they're shouting praises, and you're saying, uh, do you hear what they're saying? I'm saying, yeah, I hear what they're saying, because God perfected praise, to shut the enemy up. So I'm telling you, shut up. Let them sing. Let them shout. He is referring to them as the enemies of God. And I don't know that they see it or they don't see it. Maybe they do, because shortly after this, they take counsel among themselves to see how they can have this Jesus killed. So they're, they're ugly at them. And I think they probably got the message there. Even if they didn't, they may get it later. Sometimes people can't see themselves in the stories that we talk about out of the Bible or take warnings from those who went astray in times past and learn to, uh, to not make the same mistakes. Past few weeks, we've looked at a lot of stories from the book of Judges. And we've set that aside now, Palm Sunday and Easter. We'll go back and finish that up later. But um, 
one of the things that I pointed out as we went through the book of Judges is how that Israel got into its most, most of its trouble when they did not ask God for direction. When they did what they thought was right instead of asking God what he thought was right. Uh, Gideon was one. He, he asked for confirmation after confirmation when God called him to be a judge and to deliver Israel. And he said, I, I want to put the fleece out. I want it to be dry. Ah, that's not good enough. Put the fleece out. I want it to be wet. And, and, and he, he, you know, he needed a dream. And he needed all kinds of things. He was asking God, asking God, asking God. He has this big battle. And they're victorious. God obviously did a great thing there. But later on, Gideon got into trouble because he went ahead and made a golden ephod without asking God or being instructed by God to do it. He took all the gold earrings from the, the, from the, the people that they killed. There was thousands and thousands of them, so a lot of gold earrings. There's like, I think, we, do we figure out $4 million worth of gold or something? I forget, something, something around there. And he melts it all down, and he makes this, this breastplate, this golden ephod, which was something that was used in the tabernacle worship. They didn't have a temple then. And um, he, he made this. And it became a snare or a big problem because the people worshipped the golden ephod instead of worshipping God. The problem really started when Gideon did something and he didn't bother asking God anymore. He figured, huh, I have arrived. I can do this. I got this. Yeah, be careful when, 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 you, when you get to that place in, with God where you say, I've got this, God. <laughs> I know what I'm doing. Uh, that's just about when you're about to do something you shouldn't do. And we've all had times when we e have either forgotten or we neglect to apply biblical principles to our, our actions, to our attitudes, to our decisions. And sometimes we, we do it and right away realize it. Sometimes we do it and we don't realize it for a while. And... It can happen in so many different ways, and that's why we teach these things and try to kind of point out some things that we can learn from them so that maybe when we're in a situation that kind of looks the same, we can say, well, you know what, maybe this is a good place to ask God for some help and ask him what he wants, or, you know, maybe it's better to be humble and gentle rather than all up in somebody's grill um, because that's what Jesus did. Whatever the situation calls for. Um, and I thought about my own life, and there's been lots of times, but one that, I, that came to mind several years ago, I'd finished my education um, at university to become a clinical counselor. I'd done my internship training and all of that, and I was kind of had the, the piece of paper. I was a, now a, a counselor. And somebody sent me a posting for a job that they thought I'd be interested in, and I looked it over. And uh, it was for a new position that was being created at hospice, and they wanted a counselor, and they wanted certain things. And everything they asked for, I could check that box. Yeah, had that, had that, had that. So, I mean, I, I fit all the, the criteria for it. Have you ever looked for jobs? Uh, maybe, you know, some of you haven't done that for a while, but I've looked at job postings, and they want these ridiculous list of things. And it's like, who has all that? But somehow I had all that. And I looked at it, and I thought to myself, I have a full-time job as a pastor. I have part-time jobs as well. My life's pretty full right now. There's no way that I can add another 40-hour commitment every week to that. There's just no way I'm not doing that. Um, so I did not apply, and I let it pass. Um, a month later, two more people sent me um, the same posting. It had been reposted because the, the time had passed already. It was posted. It was supposed to end in May. Now this is June, and they sent me the, the, po the reposting that was for the end of June of that year. Um, and I remember at the time saying to Pam, you know what, I guess I should at least pray about this. Oh, spiritual leader, I guess I should pray about this. Guess what I didn't do the first time? I just thought, not me, man, and I didn't even bother. And this time, it's like people keep sending, you be perfect for this. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I prayed. 
I don't know that I even had a real fervent prayer. But I had an, an honest prayer. And I felt God clearly say, put in the resume. So I took the resume and I, I wrote all the stuff that uh, I could put on it that uh, applied to the, to the job, a little cover letter, and I went and handed it in. I was interviewed and eventually hired for the job. Now, I can look back now and see that it was both God's plan and God's provision. But I nearly missed it because I neglected to take the matter to prayer before deciding what I was going to do. In fact, they actually hired somebody the first time when I said, no, not me. So other people applied, of course. I mean, those kinds of jobs are scarce as hen's teeth, and they're really uh, sought after. There's, there's way more counselors looking for work than there are counselors that get especially full-time work. They usually have to just kind of eke it out themselves, which I was okay to do. But anyway, they hired somebody. They offered them the job. They said, here's the, here's the wage, the compensation. And the person looked at it and said, it's not enough. I need, I need way more money than that. And so they turned it down. And the person that was the director there at the time, rather than just go to the next person on the list, because they did have three people that they'd interviewed once they narrowed it down, they said, you know what, let's just clear the board and uh, post it again. So they cleared the board, they posted it again. The second time it was posted, I put my name in. And they asked me, actually, at one point in the interview, the last interview, they said, um, why didn't you put your name in the first time? Somehow they'd found out that I already knew about it. And... Um, I said, well, you know, I'm a person that likes to, to keep my commitments, and I didn't feel at the time that I could commit 100% to this with the other responsibilities I had. But then I really prayed it through and felt like maybe God would help me to do that. And, of course, the person who was the director at the time was a Christian person, so they kind of understood what I was talking about. But they said, we just wondered, you know, kind of why. And, um, and I say all that to say that... Um, I nearly missed it because I, I didn't take it to prayer. And that time I know about it, there may have been other things I may have missed that I didn't know about. But God, in this case, actually in his mercy, held the door open for me just a little bit longer. And we can know the stories of the Bible. We can even teach the principles of those stories. But we need to take care that we learn from them the things that apply to our own daily lives and to our own walk with God. So, really quick, some lessons that you might take away from this story. Jesus includes us in his plans. He wants you to be part of what he's doing. So look for those opportunities. Jesus is gentle and humble. We should also be gentle and humble when reaching out to others. Jesus puts a priority on giving God praise. So let's keep our, our praise focused on God, not on religious leaders or religious organizations or anything else that, that, that people of this world do. I mean, you can, you can have your, your, your sort of um, Hollywood stars that you think are great or your sports figures that you, you look up to, but don't let that overshadow that, that God is the one who makes it all work. He gave those people their talents and helped them develop it even in those areas. And the last one, Jesus ministered to those in need. When Jesus actually got to the temple, he saw the people that needed something and were willing to accept. I mean, those religious leaders needed some healing too in a different way, but they weren't willing to accept it. But these blind and lame people came to Jesus. He healed them. He met those people at their point of need. And that needs to be our focus as well. When you see somebody needs something, be generous because God is generous. If you have the ability, I mean, there's certain things I can't do. I can't wave my hand or say a magic prayer and eliminate all COVID-19 and its variants from the face of the earth. I know some preachers have boldly tried to do that. Uh, hasn't happened yet. I mean, more power to them if they can, but I don't feel like I can do that but I can do a lot of other things. So do what you can do, not worried about what you can't do.
And if you can't sing, well, then don't join a singing group. If music is not your thing, do something else. Um, whatever God has given you to do, and maybe it is simply just to talk to the next door neighbor. You think that's not important? It was important to have a donkey tied out back. That doesn't seem that important either. When God needs what you have, he will tap you on the shoulder and say, hey, um, can I borrow your donkey? I love the story of the, and I'll close with this, I love the story of the uh, pearl of great price where the man found this pearl of great price. I mean, it's a parable. Obviously, it didn't actually happen, but it says uh, Jesus was talking about it. And he said that uh, he went and sold everything he had, and he bought the field. Now, the one was a treasure in the field, and the, the, and the other was the pearl. He sold everything and bought the pearl. In both cases, he was trying to get across this idea that what God is offering is more important than all of our stuff. But I loved it when somebody did that story and they kind of acted it out uh, in this way. They had a guy coming in, and um, he was saw this pearl that he just thought was the most wonderful thing, and he sold everything he had and gave it all to the guy, and the guy gave him the pearl, and now the guy, he's got no home, he's got no car, he's got nothing, but he's got this pearl. And then the, 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 the person who sold it to him basically says to him, he said, well, you know what, I got all this stuff of yours, but he said, uh, I need someone to take care of the house. Uh, here, here's the keys to the house. But if anybody comes by and needs a place, you know, you can give them a room because it's my house and I want you to be generous with it, but I'm, I'm letting you take care of it. And he handed him the keys to the car and, and said the same thing. And he handed him the money. He said, you know, I don't really need this right now. Just take care of it and, and use some for yourself, but, you know, you use it for others as well. And I was trying to get, that really hit me that got across that idea that all that we have has been given to us by God. We are the caretakers of it. And he's okay for us to have it. But if he needs something, we shouldn't be unwilling to say, here, God, I'm willing to help. And um, that's just a principle that Jesus uh, ministered to those in need. If, if miracles are happening, I will pray for people. And if miracles are happening, it's not me that's doing it. But if, I, if I'm a vessel to do that, I'll do that. But there's so many other areas. So Jesus met them at their point of need. And that, I hope, can be our focus as uh, followers of Christ. Father, we thank you for all that you've done for us, all that you are doing and will do for us. I thank you for the opportunities we have to be a part of the work that you're doing, that you allow us to come alongside and, and be a part of that. Lord, use us. Help us to remember always to uh, look for those opportunities, to pray and uh, ask for your guidance before making especially big decisions. And Lord, help us to have the attitude that you had, that you uh, didn't think yourself better than anybody else, even though you really were, but that wasn't the point. You put yourself in the place of a servant, one who helps others. Help us to do that, no matter what station of life we're in. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, the Lord bless you, and uh, happy Palm Sunday. We're going to close with the, uh, the blessing of Aaron. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Now go in peace. Amen.
everyone. It's Palm Sunday. Jumping up and down, jumping up and down, jumping up and down, shut Hosanna. Hosanna! Jumping up and down, jumping up and down, jumping up and down, shut Hosanna. Hosanna! Here comes Jesus riding on a donkey. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna to the King. Lay your cloaks upon the street before him. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna to the King. Jumping up and down, jumping up and down, jumping up and down, shout Hosanna! Hosanna!